start with a confession. Uh, Josh and I are both blind. <laughs> and uh, I think, I think uh, a lot of the, what we're going to talk about today, the changing the retail landscape, obviously the millennials have a big hand in that. However, Bruce, I'm sorry, Bulletproof was founded by David Asprey. He was born in 1973. Do not pin that on us. Decided to jump on this. You know, thanks, thanks, obviously, to Informa and Steve and uh, uh, Rick uh, and uh, the rest of the guys. Um, we, we didn't know we were going to kind of do a collaborative combined deck, although it's kind of very ghost to kind of do something collaborative if you know anything about the leader of the brand. Um, but I think when, when Josh and I got to talking about what we wanted to kind of present today, kind of our views, we said, "Man, you better kind of merge this, uh, merge this thing because there's a lot of a lot of overlap and a lot of shared insights." So. Yeah, definitely. And that, it looks like our slide deck is completely gone here, so I think we're just going <laughs> to shoot from the, the hip slide here. Slide slid. Slid <laughs> but basically, you know, I kind of wanted to start off by um, letting you kind of get a sense of like kind of where we are in the retail landscape right now. So um, in terms of sports nutrition, we have um, basically the biggest two distributors that have kind of consolidated. You have the kind of the biggest uh, specialty retailers that are down year over year, and this has happened over the last couple of years. Um, and then you also have kind of the biggest internet retailer that's down even worse than that. And then you have kind of legacy, what I call kind of legacy sports nutrition brands that are kind of flat, struggling, or um, EAS, which uh, if you guys are not aware, just kind of went out of business. So um, things are kind of uh, struggling in what the biggest names in the industry or what kind of people that maybe aren't in the day to day are seeing. But if you guys look at some of like analyst reports or anything like that, you you kind of see that they're, you know, over and over they're talking about 70% compounded annual growth. So where is it going? Where like who's getting this growth? Where is the revenue going? And you know, if you pay attention to kind of headlines at this point, you see that, you know, channel diversity is kind of happening with sports nutrition and the trends of like lifestyle consumers and like healthier for you and, and just product offerings are moving into, you know, the food, drug, mass convenience channels and what we kind of call the um, Wal Walmazon <laughs> migration, which uh, uh, Dan came up with this uh, one. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna trademark that. that yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's a good term, but uh, you know, the GNC and the vitamin shop, you know, they're down 5%, 10% over the last couple of years. And in relation, you have Walmart and, and kind of jet of the e-commerce side of it. And then you have just Amazon kind of picking up the slack and even taking up more of the market share. And that's kind of not only just Walmart and Amazon, but you have, you know, players like, uh, you know, 7-Eleven or you have um, just major grocers like Kroger and Albertsons that are now building out big sections in their merchandising that has, you know, protein powders and, and those types of things. But what you'll see more than anything is that most of the categories that they're picking up are like functional foods and beverages, which we consider like, you know, energy drinks or protein bars or just protein added or maybe uh, probiotics or, or kind of all those things. And that's where a lot of the uh, growth is kind of over indexing. You have um, kind of double the growth in those sections. And that's moving people to more of like mass and convenience away from um, just kind of specialty. And, and a lot of those retailers now are just kind of, kind of feeling the hurt, but. And kind of to add to that, if we go back in time a little bit to 2010, 2011, um, you know, a lot of the bigger, the bigger brands, the, the, the uh, you know, the Glambias, the Ivates, right? They were already doing business with Walmart. They were already doing business in club with Sam's Club and, and beyond but they weren't doing it with the actual flagship brand. You didn't have muscle tech per, per se in, in Walmart. You didn't have Cellucor in Walmart at the time. And what, what's happened over the past couple of years is the, the bread and butter brands of your GNCs, the specialty brands that were in Vitamin Shop, that were bringing people to bodybuilding.com, um, they're now available on all these channels. And that's, that's really what you've seen over the past few years. Um, and that's kind of why the retail, there we go, um, you know, retailers stop giving customers a reason to shop. The brands that used to bring people in the door are not there anymore. So we can, you know, we're going to talk a lot of, 
a lot today about Amazon. We're going to talk a little bit about you know the change in consumer preference. But one of the most basic reasons that I think a lot of times people avoid or they forget when they talk about, oh man, Bodylon.com is down. Well, every brand available on Bodylon.com is now available on Amazon Prime. I can purchase that sitting at home in my boxers, bundled with my toilet paper, and it's going to be there the next day, right? And that wasn't true. That wasn't true just a few years ago. Uh, what can retailers do about this? Um, number one, I know we, you've talked a lot about this, so jump in any time. Streamline the footprint. Uh, it's, uh, I know Josh has had a couple of videos this year about GNC closing some stores. Um, you know, we're, Ghost is a major partner of GNC, and frankly, I think they're probably going to close a few more stores. I think getting a more streamlined footprint, um, getting rid of kind of, uh, you know, trimming some of the fat is, is inevitable, if not, if not a good thing, um, number one. Number two, exclusive products. Uh, as I kind of was just talking about, you know, what items are going to uh, incentivize, if not force, okay, a customer to come in the store to buy. Uh, number three, exclusive experience. When a customer comes to the store, what's happening? Is it just transactional? Because if it's just con con uh, transactional, then it might as well be in Amazon. You might as well kind of sit at home bundling it with, you know, your toothpaste, right? You have, you have to have more, and I think that um, the point that we want to make today, even as millennials, even as the guys who love to shop from our phones, um, we can't be without our phone for five seconds. He's got his, I got mine in my back pocket. You know, what's, what's, going, what's going to continue to, to, to drive the growth is the brands, the products, and the experiences that are going to make even the guys like us get off the couch and go into the store. Yeah, so, you know, kind of the next kind of pillar of retail, like, at this point, private label is, you know, massive and any retailer is doing themselves a disservice if they're not offering uh, the most amount of private labels that they can. Um, this also kind of creates like a moat around your business. Obviously, if you create your own private labels, those are not going to be at you know other retailers or any other kind of channel. You kind of get to select where those are at. So you're able to kind of build up a little bit of a wall to offer those kind of exclusive products or 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 anything. And the the point of, of, of just kind of with house brands or, or private label is that, and, and we'll kind of talk a little bit more about this like just with brands in general, is that um, you're, you're trying to control your own destiny. You know what I mean? You, you want to make sure that you have as many options out there to uh, make sure that you're not kind of at the mercy of, of bigger players that are, or, that are kind of taking your point via the Amazon. And, um, you know, this kind of the last point of like just we talk about digital. Um, the streamlining of the footprint. Some of the bad headlines, I guess, that get out there about like closing stores is ultimately not always a bad thing, um, because there's you know delivery and, and e-commerce, and, and I work with some also like grocery categories um, with you know click and collects or like uh, Instacarts and uh, two-hour deliveries. Um, it ultimately helps the retailer to not have to have. 30, um, 30 locations in a market. If you need to, you know, only have 10 or 15, but you have the ability to offer maybe click and collect or, or e-commerce solutions, you're just ultimately helping your business, you know, grow its gross margins and things like that. It's not ultimately always bad to have closures of retail. And I think that all of these retailers, or even at the biggest ones at Walmart, are going to see a retraction in their locations, or they're gonna see a kind of a changeover in what those locations look like. You know, Walmart's a good example, but even with the GNC or, or Vitamin Shop, probably is a better example, they have a large kind of retail footprint. They have more square footage than, on average, than a GNC does. Why utilize all of that with just, um, you know, shelving in the sense of like walking in as a consumer? You can turn some of that into like a micro shipping point or things like that. that um, ultimately, in, in 2020 and maybe and beyond, you're going to see a lot more people utilizing retail space in a much different way. I think you're going to also see a lot of retailers beginning to leverage the digital platforms for themselves. I mean, GNC is a great example of that. They've actually shown, uh, I think, quarter over quarter growth in their e-com channel, and that's being driven by GNC actually fulfilling Amazon orders. But wait, I thought Amazon was a GNC killer. GNC's, GNC's making money off it. So, I mean, I, I think you... What, again, today is not going to be about right or wrong. It's not, a, it's not going to be about a clear path of black and white because that certainly doesn't exist uh, in this industry probably ever. 
Um, but I think specific to, to this, when we talk about you know what retailers can do and some of the changes you can expect, let's not let's we not forget that the retailers are actually also able to take advantage of the same networks that brands or the individual sellers um, are able to do. Yeah, I think I mean Bruce, we we've, we've talked before, so I'm not taking a stab directly at Bruce, but basically uh, we talked one time off of the podcast, and we were talking about millennials and his frustration with millennials, and I said, you know, ultimately. You could, you know, complain and, and kind of not really do anything about it, um, but if you don't change or adapt, you're, you're ultimately just going to die in the market because there are going to be people that meet those needs, and the people that meet those needs are going to be there longer term. And, and the comment around Generation Z and what is kind of Generation Z and what that's going to be, I can, you know, wholeheartedly believe that they're going to be worse off than worse than us in terms of like digitization. Uh, their need to communicate directly with brands and, and just a lot of the things that maybe frustrate brand owners and people that have been around in the industry for a long time. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse, I guess, if, if you think about millennials in a, in a negative sense. So it, it's at this time where you kind of have to sit and kind of adapt. And, and, and to Dan's point, I mean, the, the point of this is it's about adapting and, and kind of getting what you can out of, uh, out of this kind of future. Yeah, I mean, if you can understand the, the variables and you can understand kind of the rules of the game, um, you can craft your own strat, your own strategy or approach of whatever works best for you or your brand or your your business strategy. Um, if you know anything about me or Ghost, we uh, we love our sneakers, and I think that in a really interesting or intriguing example of retail that is continuing to work uh, in today's digital age uh, is sneaker stores. Uh, you know, sneaker stores via limited drops, um, uh, limited edition you know merchandise or sneakers or apparel. Are, are able to drive people to store. They're, they're lining up outside the store. And then when you get to the store, is it simply transactional? Is it you know very vanilla? No, there's usually you know a good atmosphere. People want to hang out there. They want to you know post pictures with their friends there. A lot of uh, even the, the the sneaker retailer that I pictured here, which is Kith in New York City, um, they actually have a, sne a, a cereal bar where you can get like snacks or, or uh, you know drinks there. I mean, people are inviting them into a, a shopping environment and getting them to stay there longer, maybe as an escape from their phone, or as a supplement to kind of the entertainment in the, that, they're, that they're otherwise getting. And, you know, I don't have the data in front of me, but I'm going to uh, bet everything that the average uh, uh, or the core demographic of a Kith sneaker store is, in fact, you know, going to be that millennial shopper. What can brands do? So... Um, first thing, innovate innovation is kind of something that I think has become a personal mantra of mine, and I've shared it a little bit, a little bit with, with Josh. And I think it's it's kind of an interesting concept. Um, if we go back again, back in time in the industry, you know, five or six years, and we think about like what what was innovative, right? Um, you know, to me, uh, it was maybe bogus claims. You know, that the concentrated pre workout was going to give you gains. Yeah, that was innovation. Uh, you know, six seven years ago. Um, that uh, another brand was introducing a, a, a compound that um, you know was only found on a walrus tusk in sunny days in Madagascar, you know, to, whatever. I mean, like that was innovation five six years ago. And you know, today we, we talked initially uh, about um, uh, qualifying ingredients and and everything that goes into it, and how much money and how much time it takes to bring a new ingredient to market. And then the second thing we talked about was actually the, the shrinking pool of legal ingredients and how you know year over year, even something like an epicatechin uh, from uh, a green tea or dark chocolate is now gonna be on the water list for 2019. Um, and if you think about the industry from that perspective, uh, the formula, the science almost becomes a common denominator because the other big trend in the industry is full disclosure labels, right? I think that's personally one of the best trends to hit the industry in the, since the industry's inception, at least here in the U.S. Other parts of the world, Canada, they mandate full disclosure, but here in the U.S., there's definitely been a huge move, move towards full label transparency, no proprietary blinds. So, ingredients, new ingredients are hard to come by, ingredient pool is shrinking, your whole formula is on the side of the bottle. You need to rethink what it even means to be innovative. And, and I think that um, that kind of goes directly into my next point, which is delivering maximum value. Um, it's not just going to be the formula anymore that sells that sells a product. It's going to need to be what, what happens on the front of the product. What's the brand like? What are the flavors? 
is it unicorn and rainbows or is it something else that's pretty cool and i'll get to that in a in a second but i think it's 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 the point i want to make here with brands is the whole game has changed you have to rethink what makes your brand or your product innovative uh in today's market yeah and a good i mean a good kind of example that i kind of always use with clients especially legacy clients is that you know when you used to kind of get into market and go on the shelf of, of a vitamin shop or a GNC and you sold a pre-workout, um, you might have had 10, 20, maybe even 50 people to compete against on those shelves. And that's, um, that's all you kind of had. And now with the kind of lower barriers of entry to like distribution, um, you, can, you can open up a direct-to-consumer website or an Amazon uh, you know, listing with a few clicks of your mouse. Um, you have just a, a total kind of uh, proliferation of like, like brands that are coming out there. Now you have a digital shelf that has 50,000 free workouts. Now, how do you differentiate? Because you might think you have the best formula out there. You, you put all this time and effort and everything and it's perfect. I guarantee I can find you another hundred that are probably exactly the same like you. And so it's a matter of like taking that and eliminating that. That's kind of the, uh, I was still like, the having a good formula, having a good taste, that's the entry point to having a good brand at this point. The, you have to get past that. You have to elevate and think and utilize some of like the tools that are available to you in the market now. You have, you know, social media that you know was talked about maybe negatively in, in some sense, but in 2007, I, I would say like the, the telephone game ended. Like you had the ability now to be opening up your Facebook pages and directly communicating with the consumers you wanted to talk to. You can target them however you would like to. You can get data from them in a way to, you know, kind of knock it down to such a small little level to really understand who your customers. And then when you figure that out, that's where the innovation comes from. If you can target those people and kind of give them the right point, uh, the right, you know, kind of creative, the right, uh, you know, the right time, the right price points, all those types of things, that's how you win. It's no longer about, you know, just the formula, just the flavors, just a, there's kind of an extra level to that and. You know, we were talking about the last point, I don't think Ian talked about it a little bit, but like, because you have the ability to directly kind of be a part of the, the, con the consumer, um, you're no longer working through like intermediaries all the time of like a distribution or a retail partner. Um, you have to think about this no longer as just transactional and thinking about like creating relationships with those customers because the customer does, millennial customers, they do want to be a part of the process. They want to be heard, they are entitled, they, but what's wrong with that? Feedback loops are great. Feedback loops are what make your brand great. If you're able to take what you know, people tell you about your brand and change things, um, you're ultimately getting to the point where you have that great innovation that's gonna put you apart from everybody else. So though maybe some of those things may seem negative, I always think about those things being kind of a positive in my mind. So, but you know, I know I've mentioned this a little bit before, but it's like, at this point, brands or retailers or anybody, you, you can control your own destiny now. You, like, there's no longer like, oh, it's somebody else's fault. It's your fault if you're not, you know, you're not adapting, you're not winning now. It's your fault, it's not somebody else's fault at this point, so. Yeah, and it's funny, I think that the one, one point where we do almost differ in opinion on prioritizing the first hand, I used to say first hand up there, first hand customer relationships, um, you know, for me, I always ask the question, or I have to wonder if it's a little bit late for some of the legacy brands. If you're if you're a brand that's been in this industry for 10, 15, 20 years, and the only relationship you've ever had with the consumer actually was was facilitated by a distributor, or by even a third hand relationship, distributor sold to a retailer, and then that customer interacted with your brand, for you to all of a sudden try to go and, and jump into the pool and say, hey. Um, We've known each other, you've been a customer for 10 years, they have no idea who you are. And that's that's a real problem, I think, for, for legacy brands that um, that is uh, something that needs to be critical, uh, they need to think critically of, and I think potentially you can argue gives a, a newer brand um, maybe a little bit of, little bit of advantage in, in that regard. Yeah, I mean, you're worth a blank slate. I mean, you, you definitely don't have to work against uh, the tide. Yeah. Um, but on the flip side, I mean, those legacy brands have all the resources in the world. It's just a matter of them changing the way uh, their, their kind of you know, paradigm shift and the way they think or attack uh, problems. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, 
a little bit of shameless self-promotion, I guess. But you know, and when we talked about, when I talked before about innovating innovation, you know, I mean, you walk into a store, digital, brick and mortar, whatever, uh, and you know, there's 10,000 watermelon, um, you know, watermelon flavors on the wall, right? Well, to stand out, how you know, what's one way you can do that? You know, Go is something I'm very proud and humbled and a little bit mind blown over is that we were the first in the industry in 2016 to introduce authentically licensed products, licensed flavors to the industry. Um, go to your whole gro your grocery store, everything is, is licensed. You have Girl Scout cookies, cereal, you've got you know uh, Reese's ice cream. I mean, the whole thing is licensing. How did that miss this industry for so long? It's mind blowing to me. Um, and so what we what we went out and did is actually you know Swedish Fish uh, hit it on the hit, hit over the head, Bruce, uh, and then Sour Patch Kids watermelon to add a layer of authenticity. The millennial customer is not hard to figure out, in my opinion. And I don't think that, and it expands beyond millennials. I think the customers today, um, with so many options hitting them from so many different angles, authenticity, brands they know, nostalgia is a very powerful emotion. And if you can channel that with, with an authentic logo or not, you're going to win. You just have to think of, you know, think, um, you know, critically about how you can appeal to a customer outside of the claims of yesterday that we're sitting in a magazine and oh, I'm gonna buy this because it's new or I'm gonna buy this because it's gonna give me 5% more muscle mass. People want something that resonates with them, that's what they're gonna spend their money on. And if you can think about it from like, okay, it's gonna be a brand, it's gonna be a flavor, it's a it's an ambassador, an influencer, a YouTube channel, it's a formula, it's an, it's an ingredient. It can be any one of those things. I don't think either of us feel like we're smart enough to figure out why any one particular customer buys. But as Josh said, the barrier, the, the, the standard today, you know, a good formula and a good flavor uh, just gets you a seat at the table. That's not gonna, that's not enough to win anymore. Yeah, thank you, Jeff Moore. Yeah. And I, I know that's a, kind of a hot topic or a hot word in terms of Amazon. Everybody's kind of trying to understand what's going on. And, and for somebody that is kind of day-to-day -day in Amazon, I'll tell you that like things change at, at a speed that you just are not, used to. Um, you have big announcements out of Amazon on a day-to-day -day basis, and these these announcements can critically change um, the landscape of, of what you're doing out there competitively. And, you know, myself and Dan probably have a different idea of Amazon. I think Dan's pretty proud to, you know, to say that Ghost is, is growing so fast and then also not on Amazon, which is uh, very unheard of in the industry. And I think that the way that Dan built his brand in this first phase or second phase, whatever he's considered at this point, um, he's done such a great job that he didn't need that. Now, I, I think he'll agree that eventually he'll come uh, out in some way with Amazon or, or some type of thing. So he doesn't have a negative thought of Amazon, but um, I think we probably differ in a little bit of what we were kind of talking about. But Amazon and why Amazon is so important to brands and why brands need to not kind of turn an eye to is that Amazon owns what you consider first product search. So first product search is considered um, the digitization of like same store comps, like this is this is market share. Where your first product search starts is who's winning. So Amazon right now has over 50% of consumer products start on that search engine. So no longer do people go on Google and you know, type in pre-workout or whatever. They just go on Amazon, they skip the clicks, they go to Amazon, they, they figure it out, and then if you're not on Amazon or um, or if you maybe don't utilize Amazon the right way, the information's not out there. So uh, people kind of, you have to, in a brand sense, you have to think about it in a way that, that it's kind of your second website. It is kind of the place where a lot of people are first either finding your brand or getting the information about your brand. So it's, I think of, at least with my clients, like Amazon is, is can, you can utilize it in so many different ways. It just depends on how intricate you want to get with it. You know, just having a product listing, that's important because of so much of the, of the search traffic there. Um, having feedback loops and having you understand as a brand what's doing well and what's not doing well so you can make decisions on cutting flavors, changing flavors, changing for product formulations, whatever. It gives you that opportunity. And then, like on a kind of a deeper level, you have the ability to, quite honestly, like A-B test or, or A-B-C test type things like, and to Eric's uh, point with his kind of presentation, he, he essentially did that. He took an existing product, he relabeled it, stuck it into market with different value propositions, different kind of branding propositions, 
and try to see if it would work. Um, I think the same thing with like another product in his market with like Gamma uh, Labs, he kind of did the same thing back uh, several years ago. It's kind of, it's not always the product, it's not always the flavor, like, but Amazon gives you the ability to test things in so many different ways. You're gonna see brands utilizing it in a much more complex way after they figure out there's a lot of different opportunities for them on there. And I know one of the points that a lot of people have been kind of bringing up is like this private label incubator and what's gonna happen. Amazon's now gonna compete against the brands that are out there. Um, I just tell people if, if you are worried about that, then um, you're probably already dead in the water. It's kind of like, you know, wherever you compete, even if you're at GNC, 50% of the revenue comes from private labels. So if you're competing against private labels wherever you go, Amazon maybe is a little bit smarter and nimbler than other retailers, but it's just kind of the name of the game and it's just kind of one of those things you kind of have to do. But I'll talk to Dan if you have some points on Amazon. Yeah, Ghost, Ghost is actually the only brand at GNC not on Amazon and that was uh, a pretty big fight to get us pulled off kind of their, their partnership with Amazon. And uh, I kind of got on it a little bit before, but for us it was all about taking away the transactional feeling um, of Buying a buying a or the commoditized feeling, uh, the commodity feeling of, of buying a pre workout or buying a supplement. Um, you know, at the end of the day, whether whether you're marketing a supplement, um, uh, as I said for, as a pre workout or as a gaming product, same product, uh, or as a a, pro, a a post workout shake or a on the go snack or a, a breakfast. I mean, it's, it's a way it's a wavelength, right? Um, a lot of times, as Josh was kind of saying, it's, it's all it's all in how you spin it. And what we really wanted to do with Ghost, and the reason we're not working with Amazon currently, um, is to is to put the special kind of back and specialty, and, and make sure that we are are um, are meeting our customers in a place where we kind of control the variables, and we're able to offer experience much more so than just like the, the one click add to cart. Uh, we felt like it was more um, more advantageous for long term brand brand building in order. To So I think I think in closing, um, yeah, I think we kind of jumped around a little bit uh, on, on kind of what what retailers can do, what brands can do in, in today's kind of changing retail environment. We talked a little bit about you know obviously how to kind of uh, approach approach the the Amazon jungle so to speak. Um, but at the end of the day, I think what's what's most important um, is that uh, the two of us don't know everything, and. Um, with things changing as fast as they are, there's not gonna be one golden ticket strategy. I think that for everybody based on your, your whether it's your savvy, your business strategy, your, your product, who you feel your customer is, um, you're gonna have to pick the road um, uh, that works the best for you. But I would, I would uh, empower you and challenge you to think um, about innovating what it means to be innovative and challenge yourself to try to deliver on multiple facets of a brand or a product. It's not just a good looking label, it's not just a good product, it's not just a good flavor, it's not just a good ingredient. If you don't have it all, you're not gonna compete today. That was good. <laughs>